Chapter 32 Travel Pilgrimage All public cars are on the grid, but sites can track their movements until their navigational data is dropped into the back brain. That happens every 60 minutes, so that's how often you'll have to change cars. South Korea's instructions had come at sidetrack quickly. She only hoped she could remember them all. She could do this. Her apprenticeship had taught her to be self-sufficient and resourceful. She ditched the first public car at the small town right on time. She was worried that there might not be as many vacant public cars in the chill Argentine region, especially this remote an area, but the Thunderhead was remarkable at projecting local need. In all things, there always seemed to be a supply to feed the demand. She had already changed into the coarse Tony's frock and had pulled its hood over her head. It was remarkable how people avoided her. Vehicle changes every hour meant that her pursuers were always right behind her. She realized she had to cut a weaving curse, like cargo ships in mortal age wartime, to throw them off her path and keep them from anticipating where she'd be next. For over a day, she could never sleep for more than an hour at a time, and several instances when there was only road and no civilization for long stretches, she had to be crafty ditching the car before arriving in town, where chill Argentine sites and officers of the local blade court were already waiting for her. She actually walked right past one scythe, certain she'd be caught, but she was smart enough to cross downwind of his DNA detector. The fact that the sites themselves were supervising the hunt and not just leaving it to the blade court made Saitra feel all the more terrified, yet oddly important too. Once you reach Buenos Aires, take a hyper train north, across Amazonia to the city of Caracas. As soon as you cross the border into Amazonia, you'll be safe. They won't lift a finger to help Xenocrates or to detain you. Saitra knew the reason for this from her historical studies. Too many sites from other regions clean out of their jurisdiction while on vacation in Amazonia. There's no law against it, but it has made the Amazonian side them uncooperative and openly obstructionist when it comes to assisting sites from any other region. The problem was the train in Buenos Aires. They'd be waiting for her in force at every train station and airport. She was saved by a group of Tonys headed to Isthmus. We seek the great fork in the umbilical between north and south, they told her, thinking she was one of them. There are rumors it is hidden in an ancient engineering work. We believe it could be sealed within one of the gates of the Panama Canal. It took all her will not to laugh. Will you join us, sister? And so, she did. Just long enough to board the train north, right under the noses of more watchful eyes than she could count, holding her breath. Not out of fear, but so she wouldn't trip any DNA detectors in the station. There were seven Tonists in the group. Apparently, this branch of the cult only traveled in groups of seven or twelve, as per musical mathematics. But they were willing to break the rule and add her to their number. Their accent suggested they weren't from American continents, but some were in Euroscandia. Where have your journeys taken you? One of them asked. A man who seemed the leader. He smiled whenever he spoke, which made him all the more of pudding. Here and there, she told him. What is your quest? My quest? Don't all wandering pilgrims have quests? Yes, she said. I seek an answer to the burning questions. Is it A flat or G sharp? And one of the others said. Don't even get me started. There were no windows, for there was no scenery to see in the subsurface vacuum, too. Cedra had traveled by air and on standard maglev trains, but the narrow, claustrophobic nature of a hypertrain made her uneasy. The Tonists, who must have been used to all sorts of travel, weren't bothered. They discussed legends, debating which were true and which were false, and which were somewhere between. We've been from the pyramids in Israelia to the Great Wall of Penesia in search of clues to the Great Fork's whereabouts, their leader said. It's a pilgrimage that matters. I doubt any of us would know what to do if we actually found it. Once the train reached a cruising speed of 800 miles per hour, Citra excused herself to use the restroom, where she splashed water on her face, trying not to let exhaustion overtake her. 
she had forgotten to lock the door. Had she done that, her journey might have played out much differently. A man burst in on her. Her initial thought was just that he didn't know someone was there, but before she could turn, before she could do much of anything, he had a gold-edged blade at her throat, positioned to do the most damage. You have been selected for cleaning, he said, speaking in common, but with a pronounced accent that must have been Portusonian, which was the primary language of Amazonia. His robe was a deep forest green, and she remembered reading somewhere that sites of that region all wore the same green robe. You're making a mistake, Saitra said, before he could slice open her neck. Then tell me my mistake, he said, but be quick about it. She tried to come up with something that would stay his hand other than the truth, but she realized there was nothing else. I must say, apprentice, if you tried to glean me, I would just be revived and you would be disciplined for not checking your ring first to see if I had immunity, he smiled. It is as I thought, you're the one they are looking for, he took the blade away from her neck. Listen to me carefully, there are children down inside aboard this train disguised as regular passengers. You can't avoid them, but if you wish to remain out of their clutches, I suggest you come with me. Saitra's instinct was to tell him no, and that she'd be fine on her own, but her judgment pulled ranked on instinct, and she went with him. He led her to the next car, where, even though the train was crowded, there was an empty seat beside him. He introduced himself as Saith Pozuelo of Amazonia. What now? Saitra asked. We waved. Saitra pulled her hood over her head, and sure enough, a few minutes later, a man made his way forward from the very back car, dressed like any other traveler, but moving slowly and consulting an object in his palm that looked like a foam but was not. Don't flee, whispered Saith Pozuelo to Saitra. Give him no control of the situation. The device began to click like a ginger counter as the man reached them, and he stopped his quarry found. Saitra Terranova, he said. Saitra calmly removed her hood. Her heart was pounding, but she didn't let that so. Congratulations, she said. You found me. Gold star for you. He was thrown off by the expression, but that didn't stop him. I am taking you into custody. He pulled out a gold button. Do not try to resist. It will only make it worse for you. Now, South Pozuelo turned to him. On whose authority do you do this? On the joint authority of Lautorio, High Blade of the Chile Argentine region, and High Blade Xenocrates of Mid America. Neither of which have any jurisdiction here, he chuckled. Excuse me, but. No, excuse me, said Pozuelo, with just the right level of indignation. We crossed into Amazonia at least five minutes ago. If you attempt to press your advantage in any way, she has every right to defend herself with lethalist force, even against a scythe. Saitra took that as a cue to pull out the hunting knife she was concealing in her frock, and she stood to face him. Make one move with that bait on and they'll have to reattach your hand. Behind him, a porter came into the train car to see what the commotion was. Sir, said Saitra, this man is a Chile Argentine scythe, but isn't wearing his ring or robe. Isn't that against the law in Amazonia? Never had Saitra been so happy to have studied her scythe history. The porter looked the man over, and his eyes narrowed to a suspicious glow, suspicious enough for Saitra to know where his allegiances lay. Furthermore, all foreign sites must register before crossing our border, he said, even when sneaking in by a tumult. The Chilargentan site's tempo quickly began to boil. Leave me to my business, or I will glean you where you stand. No, you won't, said Saith Pozuelo, with such matter-of-fact calm it made Saitra grin. I've granted him immunity. You can glean him. What? Then the Amazonian scythe reached his hand right up to the porter's face, who grabbed it and kissed his ring. Thank you, your honor. This man threatened violence against me, said that old the porter. I demand he be put off the train at the next stop, along with any other disguised scythe he's traveling with. That would be my pleasure, said the porter. You can do that, the scythe insisted. But a few minutes later, he found out otherwise. With her pursuers kicked off the train, Saitra enjoyed the respite from the relentless cat and mouse game. Her cover blown, she pulled on street clothes that fit her from someone's luggage, jeans and flowery blues that wasn't her style, but the clothes were adequate. The Donists were disappointed, 
yet didn't seem at all that surprised that she wasn't actually one of them. They left her with a pamphlet she promised she'd read, but suspected she wouldn't. Whatever your destination, Saith Pozuelo told her, you have to change train at Amazonas Central Station. I suggest you meander through several different outbound trains before boarding the one you're actually taking, so that the DNA detectors will send those chasing you every which way. Of course, the more she wandered the station, the more likely she had been seen. But it was worth the risk to confound the DNA detectors and send her pursuers on a wild goose chase. I don't know why they're after you, Sage Pozuelo said as the train pulled into the station. But if your issues resolve and you do get your drink, you should come back to Amazonia. The rainforest stretches across the whole continent, as it did in its most ancient days, and will live in its canopy. You would find it marvelous. I thought you didn't like foreign sites, she told with a smirk. There is a difference between those who invite and those who intrude, he told her. Cetra did her best to leave DNA traces on half a dozen trains before slipping onto the one bone for Caracas on the North Amazonia coast. If there were agents out there looking for her, she didn't spot them, but she wouldn't be so cavalier as to think she was out of harm's way. From the city of Caracas, Saif Curi had instructed her to follow the northern coastline east until coming to a town called Playa Pintada. She would have to avoid public cars or any other modes of transportation that would pinpoint her location. But she found the closer she got, the more her resolve hardened. She would get there and complete this troubled pilgrimage, even if she had to walk the rest of the way. How does one face a murderer? Not a socially sanctioned killer, but an actual murderer, an individual who, without the blessing of society or even its permission, permanently ends a human life. Cetra knew that in the world at large, the thunder had prevented such things. Certainly, people get pushed in front of trains, or under trucks, or off rooftops in the heat of frustrated moments, but that which is broken is always repaired. Amends are made. An ordained scythe, however, who lives outside of the Thunderhead's jurisdiction, has no such protection. To be revived is not automatic for a scythe, it must be requested. But who is there to advocate for a scythe felt by full play? Which means that although scythes may be the most powerful humans on earth, they are also the most vulnerable. Today, Saitra bowed to be an advocate for the dead. She would deliver justice for her fallen mentor. Clearly, the Thunderhead would not stand in her way. It had given her the murderous name. So had Scythe Corey when she had sent her on this mission, the final phase of her training. Everything rested on the actions she would take today. Playa Pintada, the painted beach. Today the coastline was thrown with large chunks of twisted north driftwood. In the dwindling sunset, they seemed like the arms and legs of terrible creatures slowly heaving themselves out of the sand. Cetra crouched behind a driftwood dragon, heading within its saddle. A storm was moving in from the north, building over the sea and rolling inexorably towards shore. Distant lightning could already be seen playing deep within its darkness, and thunder rolled in counterpoint to the crossing surf. She had only a handful of the weapons she had started with, a pistol, a switchblade, the hunting knife. The rest had been too hard to conceal, and so she had to cast them off before boarding the train in Buenos Aires. It was barely a day ago, yet it felt like a week. The home she watched was a single story box of a dwelling, like many of the homes on the beach. Most of it was hidden behind palms and blooming birds of paradise. There was a back patio that overlooked the beach on the other side of a low hedge. Lights were on inside, a shadow periodically moved behind the curtains. Saita reviewed her options. Where she already a scythe, she would glink him, following Scythe Curry's methods. A blade through the heart, quick and decisive. This was one instance where she didn't doubt her ability to do it, but she wasn't a scythe. Any lethal attack would merely render him deadless, and an ambudron would arrive within minutes to take him to be revived. What she needed to do was incapacitate him, take him down but not out, and then extract a confession. Was he working for another scythe or acting alone? Was he bribed like the witnesses? Was he motivated by a promise of immunity, or was it a personal vendetta against Farthey? Then, when she knew the truth, 
She could bring the man and the confession to Scythe Pozuelo, or anyone in the Amazonia, Scythe them. That way, not even Xenocles could squelch the truth. It would clear her from any wrongdoing, and the true culprit would receive whatever punishment awaits a Scythe killer. Perhaps Scythe could stay here in Amazonia then, and never have to face the awful prospect of Winter Conclave. At the last traces of twilight, she heard the sliding glass door whoosh open, and she peered over the rough edge of the driftwood to see him come onto the patio to look out at the approaching storm. He was perfectly silhouetted against the light inside, like a paper target at a shooting range. He couldn't have made it easier for her. She pulled out her pistol. At first, she leveled it right at his heart, force of habit from her turning. Then, she lowered it to his knee and fired. Her aim was perfect. He wailed and went down, and Saitra raced across the sand, leaped the heads, and grabbed him by the shirt with both hands as he writhed. You're going to pay for what you've done, she snarled. Then she saw the man's face. Familiar, too familiar. Her first instinct was to think this was another layer of treachery. It wasn't until he spoke that she had to accept the truth. Saitra? Said Faraday's face was a mask of pain and disbelief. Saitra, what are you doing here? She let him go out of shock, and Said Faraday's head hit the concrete court, knocking him out and making the horror of the moment all the worse. She wanted to call for help, but who would help her after what she'd done? She lifted his head again, crawling it gently as the blood from his shattered knee flowed between the petty stones, turning the sand in the cracks to red mortar, drying to brown. Immortality cannot temper the folly or frailty of youth. Innocence is doomed to die a senseless death at our own hands, a casualty of the mistakes we can never undo. So we lay to rest the wide-eyed wonder we once thrived upon, replacing it with scars of which we never speak, to not it for any amount of technology to repair. With each cleaning I commit, with each life taken for the good of humanity, I mourn for the boy I once was, whose name I sometimes struggle to remember, and I long for a place beyond immortality where I can, in some small measure, resurrect the wonder and be that boy again. From the Gleaning Journal of Honorable Sides Faraday. Chapter 33 Both the Messenger and the Message. Cedric carried him inside. She set him on a sofa and made a tourniquet to staunch the blood. He groaned, beginning to rose, and when he broke the tennis surface of consciousness, his first thought was of her. You should not be here, he said, his words weak and slurred, an effect of his pain nanites flooding his system. Still, he grimaced in blurry agony. We have to get you to a hospital, she told him. This is too much for your nanites to handle. Nonsense, they've already taken the edge of the pain. As for healing, they'll do the job without intervention. But I have no other option, he told her. Going to a hospital will alert the side them that I'm still alive. He shifted position, grimacing calmly slightly. Between nature and nanites, my knee will heal. It will just take time, of which I have no shortage. She elevated his leg, bended it, then sat on the floor beside him. Were you so resentful of my living that you had to exact your revenge in flesh? He asked, only half joking. Are you so offended that I managed a method of secretly retiring instead of actually cleaning myself? I thought you were someone else, she told him. Someone named Gerald Van Der Gans. My birth name, he told her. A name I surrendered when I became Honorable Scythe Michael Farthe. But none of this explains your presence here. I freed you, Saitra, you and Rowan, both. By faking my own glenning, you were both freed from your apprenticeship. You should be back in your old life, forgetting that they had plucked you from it. So why are you here? You mean you don't know? He pulled himself up slightly so he could see her more directly. Don't know what? And so she told him everything. How, instead of being freed, she and Rowan had ended up with Scythe, Scree, and Goddard. How Xenocades had tried to pin Farthe's murder on her, and how Scythe Curie had helped her to get to him. As he spoke, he put his hands to his eyes as if he might gouge them out. 
to think I was complacent here while all this was going on. How could you not know? she asked, for in her mind, he always seemed to know everything, even the things he could not possibly know. Said far they sighed. <laughs> Marie Scythe Curie, that is, is the only member of the Scython who knows I am still alive. I am completely off grid now. The only way to reach me would be in person. So she sent you. You are both the messenger and the message. The moment became uncomfortable. Thunder rumbled in from the sea. Much closer now. The flashes of lightning brighter. Is it true you died seven deaths for her? Saitra asked. He nodded. And her for me? She told you that, did she? Well, it was a very long time ago. Outside the rain, finally began to fall. Surging in fits and starts. I love the way it rains here, he told her. It reminds me that some forces of nature can never be entirely subdued. They are eternal, which is a far better thing to be than immortal. And so, they sat listening to the soothing randomness of the rain until Saitra began to grow too weary to be even think. So, what happens now? she asked. Very simple, actually. I heal and you rest. Anything beyond that is a conversation for a future date. Then, he pointed, the bedroom's in there. I expect a full night's sleep from you, followed by a recitation of your poisons in the morning, in order of toxicity. My poisons? In spite of his pain and drug induced case, says Father smiled. Yes, your poisons? Are you my apprentice or not? Saitra couldn't help but smile right back at him. Yes, your honor, I am. The longer we live, the quicker the days seem to pass. How troublesome that is when we live forever. A year seems to pass in a matter of weeks. Decades fly with no milestones to mark them. We become settled in the inconsequential drudgery of our lives. Until suddenly, we look at ourselves in the mirror and see a face we barely recognize, begging us to turn a corner and be young again. But are we truly young when we turn the corner? We hold the same memories, the same habits, the same unrealized dreams. Our bodies may be spry and limber, but to our what end? No end, never an end. I do believe mortals strive more heartily toward their goals, because they knew that time was of the essence. But us, we can put things off far more effectively than those doomed to die, because death has become the exception instead of the rule. The stagnation that I so fervently glean on a daily basis seems an epidemic that only grows. There are times I feel I am fighting a losing battle against an old-fashioned apocalypse of the living dead. From the Gleaning Journal of Honorable Scythe Curie. Chapter 34 The second most painful thing you'll ever have to do. Winter sped relentlessly closer. At first, Rowan kept a tally of the lives he temporarily ended, but as the days passed, he found he couldn't keep up. A dozen a day, week to week, month to month. They all blended together. For the eight months he trained under Scythe Goddard, he had made over 2,000 kills, mostly the same people over and over again. Did those people despise him? He wondered. Or did they truly see this as just a job? There were times when the training called for them to run, or even fight back. Most were inept at it, but some had clearly been trained in combat. There were even seasons where his targets had their own weapons. He had been cut and stabbed and shot, but never so severely that he had to be revived. He had grown into an exceptionally skilled killer. You have excelled beyond my wildest expectations, Goddard told him. I suspected you had a spark in you, but never dreamed it would be such an inferno. And yes, he had come to enjoy it, just as Scythe Goddard said he would. And just like Scythe Bolt. He despised himself for it. I'm looking forward to your ordainment, Bolta told him, one day during their afternoon studies together. Maybe you and I can split off from Goddard, glean at our own speed in our own way. But Rowan knew Bolta would never find the momentum to escape Goddard's gravity. You're assuming that I'll be chosen over Cytra, Rowan pointed out. Cytra's gone, Bolta reminded him. She's been off grid for months. If she shows her face at Conclave, the bejeweling committee won't look too kindly on her for being Hellwall all this time. All you have to do is pass the final test, and without question, you'll win. 
which is what Rowan was afraid of. The news of Citra's disappearance had trickled down to Rowan unofficially. He didn't know the whole story. She had been accused of something by Xenocrates. There was an emergency meeting of the disciplinary committee, and Scythe showed up on her behalf, clearing her of any wrongdoing. The accusation must have been orchestrated by Goddard, because he was furious at the committee's decision to drop the charges, and by the fact that Saitra had completely vanished, not even Scythe seemed to know where she was. The day after that, Goddard took his junior sides and Rowan on a gleaning rampage, fueled by his fury. He released his rage at a crowded harvest festival, and this time Rowan couldn't save anyone, because Goddard kept him by his side as his weapons caddy. Scythe Chomsky used his flamethrower to set a core maze ablaze, smoking people out to be picked off one by one by the other sides. Scythe Volta was now in the doghouse, though, because he had lobbed a container of poison gas into the burning maze. Highly effective, but it stole kills from Goddard and the others. I did it to be human, Volta confided in Rowan. Better they die by gas than by fire. Then, he added, or by getting blown away just as they thought they were escaping the maze. Perhaps Rowan was wrong about Volta. Maybe he would escape from Goddard, but he certainly wouldn't do it without Rowan. It was one more argument for Rowan to earn the rank. They had all reached their gleaning quota by the end of that awful evening, and Goddard still didn't seem to have satisfied his bloodlust. He raged against the system, if only to his own disciples, calling for a day when scythes would have no limits on gleaning. Scythe returned to Scythe Korea at Falling Water many weeks before Winter Conclave, when the month of lights had just begun, and gifts were being passed between friends and loved ones to celebrate ancient miracles that no one quite remembered. Unlike her frantic journey to Masonia's northern shore, Saitra flew home in comfort and with peace of mind. She didn't have to look over her shoulder every five minutes because no one was chasing her anymore. As Saith Curie had promised, Saitra had been cleared of any wrongdoing. And while Saith Mandela sent a heartfelt note of apology for Saith Curie to give to Saitra, Hybrid Xenocrates made no such gesture. He will pretend like it never happened, Saith Curie told her as the two of them drove home from the airport. That's the closest the man will ever come to an apology. But it did happen, Saitra said. I had to call myself from my building to escape from it. And I had to blow up two perfectly good cars, Saith Curie said wryly. I won't forget what he did. And you shouldn't. You have every right to judge Xenocrates harshly, but not too harshly. I suspect there are more variables in play than we know. That's what Saith Faraday said, Saith Curie smiled at the mention of his name. And how is our good friend Gerald? she asked, with a wink. Reports of his death have been greatly exaggerated, said Saitra. Mostly, he gardens and takes long walks on the beach. The fact that he was still alive was a secret they both planned to keep. Even Saif Mandela believed that Saitra was staying with a relative of Saif Kuri in Amazonia, and he had no reason to suspect it wasn't true. Perhaps I'll join him on his beach in a hundred years or so, said Saif Kuri. But for now... There is too much to do in the Scythum, too many crucial battles to fight. Saitra could see her gripping the steering wheel tighter as he thought of it. The future of everything we believe at Scythes is at stake, Saitra. There is even talk of abolishing the quota, which is why you must win the ring. I know the Scythe you'd be, and it's exactly what we need. Saitra looked away, without daily gleaning. Her training with Scythe Faraday over the past few months had been about honing her mind and body but more importantly, contemplating the moral and ethical high ground that the traditional side must always take. There was nothing, old girl, about it. It was simply right. She knew such high ideals were absent from Rowan's training, but it didn't mean he didn't hold on to them in his heart, despite his bloodthirsty mentor. Rowan could be a good scythe as well, Saitra offered. Scythe Kuri sighed. <sighs> he can't be trusted anymore. Look what he did to you at Harvest Conclave. You can make all the excuses in the world for him, but the fact is, he's a known quantity now. Turning under Goddard is bound to twist him in ways that no one can predict. Even if that's true, said Saitra, finally getting to the point they both knew she'd been dancing around. I don't know how I could glean him. It will be the second most painful thing you'll ever do, admitted Saitra. But you'll find a way to accomplish it, Saitra. I have faith in you. If Glyn Rowan 
would be the second most painful thing she'd ever do. Saitra wondered what the most painful thing would be, but she was afraid to ask, because she really didn't want to know. So many of our archaic traditions and rules need to be challenged. The founders, as well-meaning as they were, still suffer from a mortal mentality, having been so close to the age of mortality. They could not foresee the needs of the Scython. I would first take on the concept of quota. It's absurd that we are free to determine our method and criteria for gleaning, but not the number of gleanings we accomplish. We are hamstrung every minute of every day, because we must always consider whether we are gleaning too much or too little, better to allow us to glean at our own complete discretion. That way, sites who glean too little will not be punished, because sites who have a healthier gleaning appetite will make up for their shortcomings. In this way, we can help one another, and this in helping our fellow sites a good thing for all of us. From the Gleaning Journal of Honorable Scythe Goddard.